still have the problem. But as you can see that the, uh, the sea level continue to rise and the pump has to continue to run it in order to pump the water out. But uh, at some point, uh, either you need to have lots of pump or the pump doesn't work at all. So this is a serious issue. But the, for the private read, for the private, they could do several self adaptation, including flood insurance, uh, buying flood insurance, uh, elevate the house, or uh, have the house flood proof it. And uh, this is the one example that there are lots of uh, seawalls in Miami um, Beach trying to keep the water out, but it does not always work. So uh, another uh, way to do it is to have a construction. So basically right now, I think in Miami Beach, they elevate the street by the two feet. So as you can see here, this is one example, like elevated the street by two feet, but then where the water go, you keep the street dry temporarily, right? For two, for a few years, but the water has to go somewhere, right? And so the, sometimes the water go into the neighborhood and cause neighborhood flooding as well. Um, and then you need to pump, you pump the water out constantly. So they, they uh, install, uh, install lots of pump in Miami Beach. So what are we trying to do actually uh, we wanted to see if any kind of a solution, uh, if any kind of a current solution works, uh, and uh, what are the other options out there. So we're trying to, using a data-driven uh, approach to try to look at the historical data and uh, uh, look at the data of the, the climate, climate scientists, um, give us data, see what is the, see the world situation in the future. And then uh, look at the behaviors. We look at the behaviors of uh, uh, the uh, residents, the flood insurance, uh, and also the government. So the situation is actually, uh, it's the interactions of the three different agents. So each, like say, for example, uh, the household decide whether they want to do any adaptation themselves um, based on what governments do, right? The insurance also market is also uh, based on you know, the what what are the governments doing and what the households reactions to it. So this is always like interactions uh, between those three different kind of agents. So what are we trying to do is we're trying to model uh, the simulate you know, what each agent is doing and uh, how they correspond to other agents' behavior. So like for example, uh, for household, uh, we wanna model them, you know, how do they perceive the risk, right? And uh, what is the adaptation capacity? And uh, what is the loss reducing measures? So what are the self-adaptation measures they're trying to do? And then for the insurance market, we look at uh, the national fraud insurance program, uh, look at the federal subsidies and look at the private insurance behaviors. And we also look at the local governments, you know, how they evaluate risk, you know, what kind of mitigation plan uh, they have and uh, what is the budget. So based on the interaction of three agents, then we can evaluate what is the adaptation outcome. You know, what is the best way uh, going forward? So we put that into an agent-based model. So we look at, uh, we, here we have collect data, like input data using simulated hazard data, using historical hazard data, and uh, uh, you know, urban environment, land use, infrastructure, population, and so on and so forth, as well as local government uh, adaptation policies. And then we look at different kind of uh, uh, natural hazard uh, scenarios, and uh, we, uh, come out of the uh, output based on the simulations. 
So this is a moderate cost of storm surge, uh, different flood damages based on different scenarios. And uh, then we model the household individual uh, risk mitigation behavior. So we look at what individual the hospital is doing uh, in terms of uh, in facing the uh, flood situation. And we also look at the subsidized flood insurance with risk-based flood insurance. So the subsidized flood insurance is currently what Florida residents have. The, the flood insurance is subsidized by the government and it's not based on true risk. And uh, based uh, you know, on the uh, estimations, like if we want to say, for example, uh, based on FEMA's estimation, if a household uh, elevated the house, they could save 30 to 60% of flood insurance bill. Uh, so if you're based on the risk-based flood insurance, there is an incentive for the resident to take actions to protect the whole home. And so we look at uh, the human risk mitigation behaviors based on different kinds of scenarios. And uh, we also model the flood risk and damage uh, based on different flood uh, scenarios. So we designed the overall uh, scenario uh, for like this is uh, some of the examples that we uh, we uh, model hundreds of scenarios. So this is the like uh, examples. One is subsidized flood insurance policy. See what is the uh, output. Uh, second is uh, uh, we uh, model the risk-based flood insurance, and then we uh, continue to say subsidized flood insurance plus uh, with two feet of public seawalls. So the flood insurance and plus the seawalls and all risk-based flood insurance plus the uh, two feet of public seawalls. So based on this, then we do uh, aging-based model scenarios. Uh, simulations. So what we found that is actually very interesting. Um, we found that the average adapted community flood damage is the highest in the subsidized flood insurance policy scenarios. So in other words, uh, the subsidized flood insurance policy has caused more damage in the long run. And uh, uh, the community adoption Adaptation with seawalls could reduce average community risk, and uh, but at the same in the short run, and the re, but at the same time reduce the uh, household self with uh, self adaptation or self risk mitigations. So basically, the, it says that the if the if the community if the residents see the government doing seawalls, they say, "Hey, uh, I'll feel safe staying here." And I don't want to do anything uh, myself. And also at the same time, it attracts people from outside community to come over here because they, they perceive that the government are doing adaptation for them. So it's a false safe, safety perceptions. And we also found that risk-based flood insurance policy results in high average risk perception of household. So in other words, uh, if the, the flood insurance is based on the risk, true risk, then that will be increase the risk perception for the residents. So they have to think about twice whether they want to continue to live here or they want to move away. And uh, the community adaptation with seawall, if the uh, government build seawalls, it could reduce existing risk of flooding in the short run, but in the long run, it's actually is a uh, uh, could cause catastrophic damage to the community because, as I said before, that if you have lots of uh, uh, seawalls, then that create a false safety for the community. So the community don't want to do any kind of a self adaptation, and they don't want to move out, and they attract more people moving in, but. At the same time, the sea level continue to rise and the storm surge continue to intensify. At some point, if there is a dramatic 
the same uh, uh, dramatic hurricane comes in, it could destroy the seawalls, and that will cause catastrophic damage to the whole city. So in the long run, building seawall may not uh, create a safe situation for the community. So uh, we found that the, we wanted to suggest that we wanted to do, do a risk-based flood insurance because that will be uh, ultimately reduce community flood damage. But at the same time, it could be a uh, cost problem for, especially for low-income residents because the insurance premium will increase, they cannot afford it. And uh, they also decrease the motivation to purchase private insurance for the residents. So uh, we needed to have a government policy here to uh, create some kind of fraud insurance subsidy um, to the poor so that they uh, don't get an uh, adverse effect. Uh, uh, they could not, find, uh, could not purchase the insurance. And uh, uh, public fraud mitigation policy is important. In fact, people's resiliency but it may lead to low self-adaptation in the long run. As I said before, if we, the government do lots of work or all the work, then that will reduce the self-adaptation of the resident in the long run and cause more damage in the long run. So in conclusion, based on this uh, uh, one uh, agent-based model simulation, we found that the risk from climate change is real but the amount of risk and the impact is uncertain at this moment. Uh, adaptation policy, we have an important impact of residents' risk perception, adaptation behavior, and insurance response. That's understand the stakeholder response and the behavior is very important before we adopt any kind of policy. So here, most important point is that we need to be uh, very uh, sensitive to what are the residents should do, what's the impact on the resident, on the insurance, before we uh, launch any kind of a public policy for uh, adapt for adaptation. And uh, finally, risk and adaptation have different uh, impact on different locations and the social group. Thus, achieving climate justice is essential to promote equitable res uh, resilience. And these are some of the publications. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, all the presentations in this panel. So may I invite uh, the panelists to the stage? Okay. Okay, please. So, uh, you know, climate change uh, is a very serious challenge for all of us humanity, right? So in this regard, uh, building a resilient, resilient uh, city or society is very, very essential to fight against the impact of climate change brought to us, like, okay? So in this panel, we were discussing infrastructure building in Africa, also, we talk about how we can use the big data as, as a means to, you know, to fight against the climate change, to, to build a resilient city at the start. And we also talk about how to you know, make a, a, a adaptation plan for the uh, climate resilience. So I think uh, in that panel, we talk a lot of you know, solutions to the, you know, to uh, build, how to build, a, you know, a climate resilient cities and uh, our society. So I think there, this is very, a very important topic. I think there are many audience of have questions for the speaker, okay? So, okay. Thank you very Thanks so much for those uh, excellent presentations. I've heard a lot. Um, I found uh, a question for Amanis. I found your work really inspiring here, especially the work around uh, citizen science and citizen participation. 
Um, and um, I guess one of the broader questions I have, I think about in my own work, the challenges of bringing the findings that you get from doing citizen science and participatory research to the people that have the capacity to use that knowledge in shape policy. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the process of generating these digital stories and uh, about bridging the gap between the knowledge producers, the on the ground, everyday knowledge producers, and those who have the, the power to influence the project, influence the policy. Uh, how do we close that gap and express that knowledge uh, so that it can be integrated? Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, th thanks, uh, Jesse, on that. So there are, several, there are several ways you can do this, yeah? One of the ways is something called participatory GIS. Because we find that people with the, the local community, they might not have that high level of, of, of analysis and understanding the scientific uh, and professional standards. Yeah, but if you have a map, of A1 map or A0, and you put them together with the, the experts, they are able to define what are the issues, and by that way, you are able to pick that particular knowledge. So the issue of uh, visualization is very important to pick the concerns of the of the community, and then now as a scientist or as a practitioner. We are able now to to maybe adjust our standards according to the, the local context. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the presentations. My question goes to Dr. Romanas as well. How can cities prepare um, in in cases where we have climate change impacts? Today it might be flooding. The next time might be heat waves. So how can city and city leaders prepare for such events in terms of transport infrastructure? Yeah, uh, thanks, Daniel. That's a complex question, but uh, I don't have a simple, but I might just uh, maybe my own reflections, yeah. You see, climate require, it's a, it's a, it's a weather pattern of a long period of time, yeah. So at times when you look at the transport corridor as a proposed transport corridor, I don't know to what extent we use our climate data to inform the stability of those particular areas. That's why you find at times after the intervention, the place is flooded and you can't pass. Eh? So I think it's very important to use the, the elevation survey analysis over a period of time to help us to come up with suitable path for those particular areas, which requires a lot of time also historical analysis of a particular route which where, 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 where maybe a new project. Has been a new transport project has been proposed. So to me, I think it's quite a lot of longitudinal studies and to pick those particular parts. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, our presenters. Um, your presentation, although it is late to us, still interesting. So I have a question on um, our last presenter. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, he was looking at risk um, insurance um, to mitigate uh, the flooding. And uh, I'm wondering, um, normally floods are not uh, certain. Um, is there a way in which they have been comparated um, uh, systemic risk in their calculation uh, because uh, we normally use the non-systemic, but most of these risks are uncertain. Thank you. Okay, you your question is for the last panel. Uh, okay, is, is he online? Can you respond, Professor Paul? Can I check it? Okay, so uh, uh, we better to move next uh, uh, question if you have, and we will come back, okay? Come back later. So uh, anyone else have a question for the panelists? Okay, no? So I, I, have, I have a question for you. You know, you, you talk about big data, right? Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, more than technology, right? And uh, in the water world, that we built, uh, you know, the resilient uh, station. I, I think this is uh, very important, and where we, you know, we have to use the advanced technology 
to you know to fight against the impact of uh, climate change and to build a resilient uh, society. Right. So uh, uh, from your you know uh, point of view, that uh, do you think it will be uh, you know you you talk about the agenda, right? Uh, you should do really believe that it will be come true that. Uh, you know, you can talk about some challenges or barriers currently, you know, to for you applying such a, a technology to, you know, to build a resident uh, city. Yes, yes, so okay. if I get the question right, you're asking the, um, there are challenges to the use of big data. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so from point of view and currently, what's the advantages for us to, to apply such a kind of modern technology? And what's the barriers that we are facing Okay, so okay. firstly, we should know that uh, combating um, climate change is not something that is that simple. It takes, it requires a sort of holistic approach, which means you have to involve all the stakeholders, both the people, both the practitioners. So from the use of big data, technology in itself does not necessarily give you a solution. It depends on how you use it, the kind of training you have, the kind of data, how you kind of like train your people, because how do you train the people that drive the process and use the technology? So over time, the use of big data has been, you know, has been a thing in climate studies and how to combat climate change. But then recently, most of the challenges is that people kind of like, when they discover that some of the data are kind of like sensitive or, you know, data can be sort of proprietary and open source. So when they discover that some of these data has to do with the organization, you know, some organization have some sensitive areas and we also have data protection laws. So people can be a bit resilient because in order for you to get some data from some people, you need to have access to plug into their APIs. So if they discover that probably they're not comfortable or probably the awareness is not broad enough, they might kind of like rest. Have the right technology in place. Data is just meant for you to access. And um, just need to upskill the competence of the people using it. Okay, okay, get the results. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, response. So uh, can we, Go back to the online. No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so it's okay. Yeah. So we continue our talk. So uh, regarding so currently, what's the gap? You know, big data. You use the big data for the predictation. Uh, predictation for the uh, predict. Sorry, predict prediction for the you know. Uh, you know, climate the the, the uh, to predict the impact of climate change or. What, what kind of you know use you know what kind of usage of of this big data? Okay, so okay, Quantum. data is really just like the same data is in your order. So I made mention in my presentation, data is sitting there. Yes, it's data is there. Right? Yeah. So most of the meteorological agency we interview, they collect data on climate, on rainfall, on temperature changes, on emission, on the number of um, vehicles that enter the city. So how do you use the data? How do you collect them? It depends on the one you want to collect. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily data that is available to you now. Some data will be available tomorrow, subject to the changes in the environment. So it's just meant for you all you're willing to use it and extract it for value. Okay, okay. Okay, so we are running out of our times in this panel. So yeah, we have to you can control the time. So, okay, so uh, I will call this the end of the panel. So we have a oh, coffee break here. What's that? Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, was that a, a quick question? But otherwise, no, okay. So what we're gonna do because of time constraint, so we're going to move to the next panel, but we allow people, we can go and get coffee and come back instead of just going, otherwise we would run out of time, okay? So you can stretch and go while we're doing the presentation here, but you know, uh, we just have two very quick panels. So the um, this panel uh, will be moderated by culture. And thank you, uh, if we can to a round of questions. So, hello back.
Actually, in the ever evolving landscape of urban development, where the intricate movements of urbanization, population growth, and escalation infrastructure demands shape our cities, we embark in this intellectual path, envision the richness of insights and the depth of, of discussions and the potential for transformative ideas that will unfold in the following presentations. So I'm calling uh, the two speakers of this panel. Uh, firstly, Emma Anika. Is, is she here? Emma? Okay, so Emma is an expert in mathematical science and a senior lecturer in, at the Cooperative University of Kenya. And she will take us on an exciting journey into Kenya's transportation system, especially the vehicles that carry passengers. And also I'm calling uh, the second speaker, Mari Kamina, a part-time lecturer at the Cooperative University of Kenya. Uh, her, her critical review pours into the heart of financial models within Nairobi, Siri County. Through her discerning analysis, she sheds light on debt financing inter intersections for substantial inf infrastructure projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I know how to use this today after practicing yesterday. Uh, yeah, we are going to be looking at uh, Matatus today uh, in my topic, uh, Modeling Passenger Service Vehicle, Circle Structures in Kenya uh, for Cities, um, Transport Sector, financial sustainability. Uh, of course, this is a topic that has been uh, brought about uh, because of the fact that um, we keep getting late every morning when we come here, uh, taking a lot of time on the road. And that is why uh, we have issues and we have to tackle them. Um, I'll start by giving a background. Uh, on uh, Matatus, uh, on SACOS. Uh, in a recent report um, of uh, World Council of Credit Union, uh, we have 57,000 credit unions, uh, 6.9 come from Africa. Um, there is a saving of 1.5 trillion uh, shillings and shares of 3.7 trillion in Africa and others will have 1.5. Uh, my outline, of course, I'm talking about Matatu Sako, so I'll just, um, sorry. Uh, uh, my outline, I will be looking at the introduction, then challenges, and then evidence of the existence. Um, in Kenya, we have a uh, membership of uh, um, 5,103,000 uh, members. Uh, which is 27% of Africa. The saving is uh, 3.3 trillion, and that is 60% of Africa. Our loan portfolio is 5.3 trillion, 67% um, of Africa's, and our penetration is 20.5%. Yeah, I'm from the Cooperative University, so I have to also indicate some of these statistics. Uh, therefore, these indicate that uh, Kenya is performing very well in the um, uh, cooperatives. Um, sorry. Uh, so this is why um, there was a move to make the uh, Matatu circles be part of cooperatives uh, under a special uh, regulation. Um, so far, we have 180 registered and licensed unions, uh, which we call SACOs in Kenya. Um, according to the National Transport and S uh, Safety Authority, uh, 2022, uh, the number of transport SACOs were 636. And at that moment, only one was registered as a fully fledged SACO. There is a way in which they must not register as fully fledged circles. 
So this is an alarming statistic, considering the fact that we thought uh, by making these entire circles part of the uh, circles, it would make them more efficient. But you can see that they are not moving to register towards the broader circles. They are. Uh, you will see me indicating that they can register under uh, a different regulation, or they can join uh, the deposit taking circles and and. Uh, uh, the financing circles. Um, so, as I've said, with the other circles thriving, uh, they believe that making the Matatu circles part of them uh, was so that they can perform well. But uh, uh, so far, we are not seeing that happening uh, because a research by Kinanju uh, to bring sanity into the industry. Um, failed, okay? So there is no positive uh, uh, result um, when you check at uh, this industry, uh, thinking that because of incorporating them into the circles, it would make them better. Even we had the smaller sigmas and uh, tattoos, and there was a move to phase them out. Uh, a lot of them have not been phased out, and we still don't have any improvement, even with uh, the introduction of cardless uh, cash. So um, as I've indicated, despite all those changes, um, I know probably you stay where you don't see the chaos, but I've captured some, some of them. I hope uh, it will help you have a clear idea of, of what we go through. Um, so these circles, PSD circles, uh, clearly that idea is not working. Uh, even facing out the 14 sitter is not working. Um, we still have traffic jams. Um, if you use our roads, you will still, still experience that. We still take three to four hours on the road, two in the morning, two going back, and even more. Um, probably if you are driving, you take two. If you are not, you take more. Um, of course, when we spend a lot of time on the road and not working, we are not productive. Um, our economic growth is uh, not going to be lifted at any one time. So we complain about other things, but maybe even our economic growth is just due to the fact that we, our transport sector has issues. And basically when we are looking at this, if our transport sector was efficient, uh, like many are, uh, a lot of these many amatatus on the road uh, would not be there and a lot of these finances then would be used to be able to finance other modes of transport uh, that are sustainable, according to SDG 11. Uh, in this um, model, um, these structures are just owned by the circle managers, instead of them following the philosophy of the cooperative, uh, where we have the chairs and the secretaries, and they are elected. Uh, these drivers are just uh, employed by the circles, the circle owners. Um, a fixed amount of money, they collect uh, the amount of money and then they, they give the owner every day. Or if it is a small uh, organization, they give the few. Um, so we need just to look at uh, evidence of the structures we have uh, in the Matatu sector and see whether we can be able to model a structure uh, that will be better than the ones that exist, or find a system that we can fit better models and share with them, the stakeholders. So our objective in doing so is assessing a structure for the PSB circles that can sustain economic growth of the sector. I'll look at a brief history because history of the Matatus is important. Um, it is a public a transport, our, our public transport is generally uh, dominated by the Matatu. Uh, this term Matatu is derived from a local Kikuyu vernacular uh, called Mangotore Matatu. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce it exactly as they would want to, me to, um, which means 30 cents because initially that was the amount of money that was paid for the Matatus. Uh, in the Early 1960s, um, the total number of matatus operating uh, was less than 400, and they just did operate as taxis. 
Um, but in 1973, uh, the then president Kenyatta declared that uh, these matters should uh, carry fair paying passengers and they needed not be licensed, uh, but were to comply with the insurance and traffic regulations. Um, but before that, we had the KBS. Um, this KBS um, has taken quite some time before it went under, uh, and that was in 1934. Uh, during that time, we were colonized. Um, it was jointly owned by the United Transport Overseas Limited with 75% shareholding, and uh, Nairobi City Council with 25%. So uh, I emphasize that they were owned by Nairobi City Council then, um, and also they were owned by a United Transport um, Overseas Company. So if we go uh, later on in 1990, we had 3,333,000 uh, 300 vehicles which were registered in the country. And out of that, uh, 17,600 were matatus. That is in 1990. Uh, in 2003, the number had risen to an estimated 40,000 matatus. Um, we had uh, some hope uh, when we had a region coming into power. And uh, our Minister for Transport, called Mr. Michuki, uh, really did a lot to bring some sanity into the industry. Uh, but uh, we can see that we have gone back to where we were. Um, traffic jams are still there. Uh, the policies are not working. Uh, the drivers and conductors also are just still rowdy as usual. Uh, so we are going to look at a method to try and see whether we can structure this industry. In our methodology, we'll identify stakeholders, develop a set of indicators, uh, gather relevant data, and analyze that data. Um, this data, a lot of it is coming from TomTom.com. Um, that one initially uh, gives us um, a categorization of uh, the traffic, worst traffic index in the five African countries. Um, So if that data is analyzed, you find that uh, the most chaotic is Nigeria. I'm sorry, some my colleagues might be here. Uh, but the next one is obviously Nairobi. So we are not different. Uh, so when I am talking about uh, <laughs> five and you are there, Nairobi is number two. Um, then we have Cairo and we have Pretoria and we have Cape Town. Uh, despite uh, the good news about uh, Victoria and Cape Town, they still have a chaotic uh, transport uh, system, almost like ours. Um, so we got this data also uh, from that site, uh, a site that looks at data all over the, the world, and it is uh, fed by participants. So we got the percentage of uh, use of uh, the modes of transport. Um, and this particular one is from Nairobi. And we can see that 84.37% use their car. Uh, I will request for more time. Uh, average when primarily using walking uh, is that 12 minutes per kilometer, but I'll finish. Um, and then 0.08326 kilometers per minute. So, so this average is important because it feeds into uh, calculating the, the model we have. So our fuel economy uh, is also gotten from that side, 25.8, 35.6. And then we have the motorcycle. Fuel economy refers to meters per 100 kilometers. Um, so in our data analysis, we do it using the queuing method of simulation, um, uh, as opposed to, okay, of course, we are using the random numbers as opposed to the formula uh, because the sector is chaotic. So we'll just use random numbers. So data proportions, um, I'm requesting that I finish. If I don't finish, <laughs> 
And I have organized this thing uh, to not be fair. So let me just request I'll finish. Yes, please. I'm about to finish. So data, data of proportions, uh, proportions of use of transport modes are obtained from a reliable site. Cumulative tables of generated are uh, generated uh, arrival times. So these are calculated from values of average speed of transport modes. Uh, a random table is used in this paper to show how simulation is done. And Monte Carlo simulators will be used on a large scale for socially shared apps. So that is the random, the random numbers that we use to simulate. Um, the simulation is done as given. Uh, the simulation gives us our probability. Uh, we arranged it initially, we had bike, car, walking, bus, motorbike total. Um, then if we organize it according to the size, we get the probabilities as given. When we use the probability and uh, we get the cumulative values, we get the probability of service. Uh, once we have the probability uh, of service, then we can use it to calculate uh, the total fuel economy as given. In that, we have bus, car, and motor a bike giving us that total. So this is the way we will be comparing the structure where we have mm -hmm. just one one second. Just the discussion one minute. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so, I'm just a minute. Uh, so, um, my uh, paper, um, I co wrote this with um, um, a colleague. Uh, we were looking at the existing models. Um, and their performance. Um, currently, what financial strategies are being employed in Nairobi and its environs? And what um, can we pick from that? What can we uh, in, uh, use to inform policy on that? Uh, so um, that is what I'm going to discuss. That's my content. And uh, I can get into it a bit more. Um, yeah, so the purpose of the paper um, is a review. A lot of things have been discussed and a lot of things have been said um, concerning the financial strategies that are used to fund the city. But how can we look at this uh, on the background of the economy of the country, on the background of the financial health of the country, on the background of the current status? What can we and can't we do at the moment? Um, so we are witnessing a rapidly urbanizing world. Um, in 2021, around 56% of all global citizens were residing in urban areas, and we are expecting a 12% increase. And this is about 2.2 billion uh, individuals who are expected to live in urban uh, regions um, by, the, by the year 2050. So assuming that a city is a human being, we can say that the, light, the blood is the, is the individuals, is the people, and the, and the skeletal structure is the infrastructure of the city. So we need this skeletal structure to be strong enough to allow all of these kinds of um, life to happen in the city. So this infrastructure includes roads, uh, the energy and the water and sewerage sector. So in uh, Nairobi and its environs, there are several financial strategies that uh, are being employed. For example, we have PPPs, 
uh, infrastructure bond, debt financing, and budgetary allocations. So Kenya, um, the government has really invested in in uh, the road sector. It has about 3.5, uh, it is estimated to have about 3.5 trillion uh, um, um, in, in road assets. Uh, so that can show, that really shows that it is a major, major, major investment point uh, to the government. Now, I wanted to uh, have a short discussion on um, successful PPPs. We have um, the Nairobi Expressway, um, as one of the successful PPPs, we also have um, the SGR, um, and we also have other projects that are ongoing um, uh, around uh, Thika to Juja to Thika, some towns outside Nairobi. Um, the uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is involved in um, um, the developing or rather enhancing the sewerage uh, channels around those towns. Um, CRBC's contributions um, in Kenya, they have been contracted to uh, make two ports, uh, two railways, one of which is complete, 23 road projects, including one I have mentioned, uh, the Nairobi Expressway. Um, and I bring to your attention this a successful PPP as an area where uh, there is much potential um, to be explored both by the government and uh, CRBC as well. Now, um, we have the issue of tax revenue and uh, policy. Um, Kenya has 25%, uh, excuse me, Kenya has 25% tax to, uh, to GDP ratio. Um, for a, a city to have, have essential services and, and infrastructure provided, we need about 12%. Um, for us, for a city like, like Nairobi to attain the SDGs, we need that ratio to be about 17%. So we can see that the tax to GDP ratio is above what we need to achieve the SDGs, yet um, we are still you know, a bit slow to get there. So some reasons uh, um, that could lead to that is because of the tax gap. And why we have a uh, tax gap is because of some reasons. Uh, we have low income, we have high tax levels, we have late return, um, and and complete evasion of taxes of taxes actually. However, alongside uh, PPPs, I propose taxation as another channel of um, improving the kind of infrastructure that we have. Um, let me. Thank you. So let me move quite quickly to the land management issue. Um, we have the National Land Information Management System in Kenya. So it created an online platform called RSASA, meaning Land Now, um, where we are supposed to transition from the kind of, um, uh, we're supposed to transition into a form of a digital um, land management system. However, um, that uptake has been quite slow. And I know one of the reasons is because that uh, people don't really know about it. It hasn't really been um, uh, commercialized as it should have been. And this is one of the challenges and this is one of the areas where we can come in and find uh, some solutions, which I think is pretty straightforward. The more people know about it, the more they can use it. The more efficiently we can capture this land, the more efficiently we can be able to value the land. Um, I know that is something that came up during the course. Um, so that could really, really uh, help this city. So in conclusion, um, the solution that I am offering or the solution that uh, we wrote on would be a mixture of PPPs, um, infrastructure bonds, and uh, other forms of government funding. Um, successful projects demonstrate the potential for sustainable development. I'd like to bring to your attention one area, uh, rather two areas, where um, PPPs could uh, be used. One is the water and sewerage management area, and another is uh, the energy, the green energy area. That is still an area that is yet to be explored. 
And we could also use a tax policy modernization and land management system. Tax policy modernization has already been put in play. We have the Digital Tax Act, um, where uh, digital content is being taxed. And uh, the land management system, where I've, we've had a short discussion on the um, commercialization of the same and more advertisement of the same, uh, could be a very good channel uh, for us to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the short and using the exact time. So I don't know if there is any questions for Emma and for uh, Mari also. No, I think there is no question. Okay. Um. It's just a comment about uh, this issue of uh, 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 Dr. Emma's presentation. First, I thank you guys for sharing this. I know the time is short. That's a disadvantage, but uh, we appreciate whatever you presented here. Yeah. I think for Emma, in terms of uh, the circles, yeah, I think what's important is the intention of the circle. What was the intention? I think from the cooperative side, are they meeting the beginning of the co what is required of a cooperative? Yeah? And uh, looking at also the labor laws, eh? are these people, how do they even contribute as a circle? Or it was just a way, way of managing them as a public transport? Yeah? Actually, it's not passenger service vehicles, it's public service vehicles, not even a private vehicles, like passenger service. I got confused, but I uh, know it was just a mistake, it should be public service vehicles. Just a comment, so don't require an answer, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Would you like to answer? Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that we have to pass to the next uh, panel. Uh, and uh, the chair will be. No worries. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm really hoping that you have the energy for the next session because I still do have the energy. So we are going to have the last session of the day. We are going to combine the two last sessions. So this is panel 10 and the online um, special talk. So I'm hoping that um, our panelists will also bring the energy as we conclude the session. Please come on board. We have Jody Walsh Plaff. Tova Stalberg, Malik uh, Chopa, Juan Howe, and the last panelist will be speaking online. So welcome to the panelist. I just want to highlight because of time and because everyone wants to really take a quick break, all of you have 12 minutes. So Jody and Tova, you have a total of 12 minutes and the rest of the speakers, and I will be keeping the time. So uh, Jody works with the urban mobility team at UN Habitat under the urban basic services. And today um, he'll be talking together with Tova on revitalizing Kenyan streets through urban design and open street events. Over to you, Jody. Yes. Hello. You. So thank you very much, Joy, for, for welcoming us here in the panel. I won't take much time of you. Um, I know we are all a bit tired and we don't have much time, so I'll try to do my best to fit everything I wanted to say in these 12, six minutes in my case, because I'm sharing with Boba. Um, well, I'll skip the presentations, Joey already. Um, um, and my point here, what I would like to talk about is, I'm very happy that um, our friend Professor Romano has already mentioned participatory approaches because our case now is um, street experiments. And I'd like to start talking about them, talking maybe first about the traditional approach of a street redesign. Um, what is the problem with street redesign? I think it's a story that we all know uh, from different places in the world. So there's a street where a problem is identified. Uh, the city wants to improve the traffic conditions, improve the quality air, um, build a new bike lane, or like widen the, the pedestrian area. So there's a problem. There's willingness for a change. 
Uh, so the city puts together a large team of engineers, of urban planners, and then what happens is that these people sit down in a small room for a long period of time and trying to design which is the optimal uh, new design for the street. The, the chances are high, the risks are high because the implementation infrastructure, new infrastructure is expensive and city, the city doesn't want to do a step in the wrong direction. So they sit together for months, sometimes uh, for years, and they come finally, uh, they come out with, with a new de a decision. But then we jump into the implementation stage. And what happens? That when the citizens or the business owners that are sitting in this street or living, experimenting in the street, see the new design, they normally complain because they are used to, um, they have their habits, they are used to park their car in front of their houses, they are used to the delivery in front of the doors, and the new designs are changing the ways they are living. So what happens is that there's a massive backlash, and the massive, uh, massive backlash turns out into bad, um, a lack of so social acceptability, and then this turns out into the um, reluctance from the politicians and decision makers to uh, do more changes like that. So is there an alternative to this approach? Is there a way to do these things better, maybe in a way that can be more uh, accepted by the society, also accepted and agreed by the decision makers? The, the decision is obviously yes. Um, and we like to call this, this alternative street experiments. What are street experiments? Well, basically they are like street redesigns, but temporary and very low cost implementations. You might not know them by this name, but I'm sure you all know about open street events. I'm sure you know about pop-up interventions and this kind of activities. Those are the street events, uh, street experiments that I'm talking about. So what is the difference between, uh, between the experiments and the traditional street redesign? Um, first of all, the conceptualization is the same. So there's, there's a problem and there's the willing for a change. So there's the city that says, okay, we need to improve the situation that we have. Um, but there is where the similarities stop. Because then the planning of the street experiments, they are not long and expensive. Uh, just because the street experiments are temporary and low cost, um, the, the stakes at risk are not that high. So they manage to implement and the process is much easier and faster to, to implement. And one big difference that I like uh, that the experiments and the redesign has is uh, the implementation. Because the street Experiments involve the participation of the citizens. And that was the point of Sir Romano's report about participatory approaches, how important they are to include the knowledge of citizens, to include the knowledge of the stakeholders that live and experience those streets and not just like have high end decision makers uh, making the decisions for them. Uh, so, this involvement of citizens that happens prior, during, and after the, the, the street experiments also turns out into a sense of ownership. So then the, the citizens and also policymakers work together in terms of bringing all this knowledge um, uh, and experience and awareness of, of the change. And then this turns out to being like the, um, the feedback much more deep and much more trustful than uh, traditional strategy design. A second. So altogether, what, uh, what we achieved with, with, this, with the experiments is, first of all, <clears throat> um, they foster the creativity. Uh, like we have these tangible interventions and we have projects that are experienced and also criticized by, by actual stakeholders and street users. And this is a huge difference compared to this um, top-down uh, top approach that the traditional street redesigns have. Second, uh, the iteration factor, because we have this continuous involvement of citizens, uh, those, there's a space that is provided to interact during and after the implementation, and this strengthens the truth and the producing value um, of, the, of the interventions. And finally, um, they also encourage a culture of urban change, because there's this collaboration between municipality and citizens, there's the merge between the top-down and bottom-up uh, approach, which is merged, and it brings the best um, of both of both approaches. I know time is running short, so allow me to just give a few words about the placemaking event. This is an event, I know uh, people from Nairobi probably heard about this before. This is the Nairobi um, 
street experiment. It's happening since 2016, and it's a collaboration between the city, UN Habitat, and many other stakeholders, where every year a session is focused on one street, and we take up the street with tactic, uh, tactical urbanism, with the street activities, with the street dialogue, and we try to understand the needs and the necessities of the cities and stakeholders of each area and with them we bring the results to the city and it turns out into the future redesign of those streets this year the intervention was uh, focused in lower cbd we managed to do an intervention in, in river road and we again as i said the highlights were like tactical urbanism focus group discussions we also organized like a cycling ride uh, along the streets to criticize cycling infrastructure of, of cbd and then we also managed a street dialogue and then the last slides, I just put together a few words. I wanted to, to add some breath and some minutes in each of the slides, but I don't know how much they have, Joy. Yeah, you you are right on time. Tick -tack, tick -tack. Um, I'm just saying that you are not changing the slide. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, I, I got confused. Sorry. So these are those are the, the pictures from the last from the last um, sessions of, of Nairobi Place Making Wake. Uh, and then the highlights, uh, as I mentioned, we organized like a cycling ride with cyclists along, you can see on the left side, uh, the route that we did along the lower CBD and with a team of cyclists from different cycling organizations where they analyzed and evaluated um, the cycling situation of those streets. And then we also created space in River Road like for, for a street dialogue. We took out all the parking space of the street and then we put there some uh, design proposals and we put together a team of experts who were discussing and encouraging the patients by to add their opinions and their needs and express their necessities from the street and the neighborhood. Um, and then there were also like focus group discussions here. You can see um, on the left side, Toba and I talking with a, a group of cyclists. Um, and on the on the left side, there was also like um, uh, a meeting with the SACO organizers and also business owners. So those are all like highlights from the from the Nairobi. And now I'll leave the, the floor to Toba to talk about the matching concept. Thank you. Okay. Oh, what happened to the presentation? It's, it's the same presentation. Okay, perfect. Like that way. Hmm, it's not working. Okay, great. So, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to discuss the topic of nudging. So, what is nudging? Nudging is about making people change or adapt to something different and make them feel good about the decision. I want us to reflect on our daily choices and particularly our reliance on cars and how they have shaped our modern lifestyles, which influences our health, climate, and road safety. Now, I would like to pose a question to each one of you. How many of you rode or drove a car to get here today? Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Not more, only five people. I think you're lying to me. I promise, I think you're lying. Only five drove a car. So the rest, 25 people, you rode a bicycle. That's impressive. Okay, let's continue. Um, well, for me, nudging is also about making people walk and cycle. So how many of you walk or cycle to get here today? One person, wow. I mean, you can already leave the room. You know what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we all want to understand why so many people rely on cars. Why so many people aim to buy a car. And why so many people doesn't walk and cycle more. It is actually part of our nature since we are wired to conserve energy and we prefer not to reflect for too long. And due to this, we tend to mimic each other, especially in groups. And this often overrides our good intentions. Moreover, 
with limited attention, often situated in critical situations, we tend to forget important information, such as letting people cross the street. And this present-centric behavior hinders us from reflecting on past information and future consequences. We can make great solutions that can change this. And the only thing needed is a push, i.e. a nudge. Nudging has been widely popularized by Richard Thaler, who is an American professor in behavioral science and economy. And he also won the Nobel Prize in 2017. Nudging has been called being a Bible. A Bible for helping governments make small policy changes. It is about framing choices, positive or negative, in a way that makes people choose what's good for them and the community. And it is without telling them what to do and without changing big things. So this is a gentle way on how to influence people to do things. It is without forcing them, it is cheaper, and sometimes even more effective than using enforcement, penalties, or making new laws. And when making policies, it is also under, important to understand how our brains work, because our brains work in two different systems. System one is a quick, intuitive, and automatic mode that makes people take decisions fast, and it doesn't require much thinking or deep thinking and awareness about what you're doing. So here, the nudges explode our fast and spontaneous reactions to foster this impact and it doesn't require demanding. System two is a slower and more careful mode that engage our reflective and analytical aspects of the brain. They require a conscious thought and a deeper level of consideration, often involving detailed information about the consequences of specific behaviors to help people make thoughtful choices. I'm going to introduce some effective nudging techniques that has been designed to seamlessly integrate into our daily routines, encouraging walking and cycling while promoting road safety. Now, let's direct our attention on walking and cycling. Well, um, system one nudges can use vibrant signs and markings for sidewalks and bike, bike lanes to guide the cyclists and pedestrians how to move around in their city, letting them own the space but also it doesn't require much thinking. It is just there as a visual cue. For deeper reflection, system two nudges needs an app to highlight health benefits, environmental impact, or even save money, such as how much do you save by not paying your gas? Educational campaigns can raise awareness on benefits and also provide hands-on experiences, such as um, having an open street date, as I already mentioned before. Sharing inspiring stories, experiences, and short videos, and also hashtags and signs like every step counts, promote your health, and walk every day can encourage movement. Moving on, creating road safety. System one nudges can use a shock nudge. This can, for example, include fear-inducing signs on highways that creates an immediate automatic response triggered by the fear of the negative consequences of unsafe driving. And at the same time, implementing road signs and markings that are clear and easy guides the drivers how to move around in their cities and also follow the traffic rules. On the other hand, system two nudges can also include campaigns, as I mentioned before, addressing various um, issues such as drunk driving, wearing helmets, or speeding. Additionally, signs such as look both ways before crossing provide information to think before crossing a street. Sorry, Tova, uh, mm. please start wrapping up. I have to wrap up, okay. I was supposed to give a really interesting example, but we can make that as a discussion later. Okay, so, however, we can also nudge by fear not through enforcement, penalties, or making new laws, but through actions that shake people and push them. Let me share an example. If you come to Sweden and want to cross a street, you could close your eyes, walk straight out of the street, and no one would hit you. Interesting, right? So, but this hasn't always been this 
way. For example, in the 90s in Stockholm, people, no cars stopped at the crossings. The, even if they faced imprisonment or fines, they still drove. But this changed over one night. The reason for this is because a TV host created an inside this program and he started crossing the street right before a car came. The car immediately had to brake. And then the TV host walked straight up to the car and kicked it. He broke the window and he kicked the door. Why you think? And then the driver of course came out. I'm gonna sue you. You need to pay for my damaged car. And then the TV host replied, you can sue me, but I will sue you for not stopping and you were breaking the law. So after this, more people started doing the same. They started kicking on doors, on all the cars. And people were still starting to get afraid of their cars being damaged, of course. So after a while, cars started stopping at pedestrian crossings because of the fear of damaged cars, of course. So with this, a question arises, what is right and what is wrong? Of course, I don't believe we should start kicking and destroying car doors, <laughs> but we should encourage people to change their behavior. And either consciously with system two nudges or unconsciously with system one nudges. And as I mentioned earlier, we mimic each other. So if someone will start acting differently, others will do the same. And now, 30 years later in Sweden, two generations later, cars consistently stop at pedestrian crossings. And as I told you, you could walk, I mean, you could close your eyes and walk out. It's that good. But it's not the fear anymore, I promise. Um, but we all want to aim for positive results, making cities not just efficient and eco-friendly, but we also want our cities to be safe and welcoming and including for everyone. And that is exactly what nudging does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tova. Thank you, um, Jordi. That was really interesting looking at different techniques on how you can promote street safety and promote walking and cycling in cities. And I really hope some of these lessons and the techniques that have been shown would be applied elsewhere. I just want to call the next speaker, uh, Malik uh, Topak. Um, uh, Malik is a PhD student at the University College London, and uh, she'll be talking about disentangling the real estate uh, assemblage in Nairobi. Yeah, this, this is the title of my PhD, and I know that it's so boring. Uh, <laughs> it's just about a kind of different angle of Kenya-China engagement. Mm -hmm. And since we have a limited time today, I would like to prioritize my findings that I get like from the field. Fantastic. Uh, so this is the, the first page. Um, Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jesse already made a really good contribution about the African context. That's why I, um, I don't have any intention to get into this. Uh, but we all know that what's happening between Kenya and China is a kind of uh, extension of what's happening between African countries and China uh, throughout all the decades. And we are seeing uh, on Kenya side that the meaning of the African uh, socialism was a kind of direction towards cutting ties with the past colonial uh, imperial and a, a kind of focusing on development pace, like development strategy, strategies rather than like uh, having an ideological background. And during the colonial, uh, yeah, during the cultural revolution, actually, the relationship between two countries has been so like uh, stopped because China favored the countries in African countries who is like having a, the same ideological opinion. And after the, uh, during the Cold War also, the relationship between uh, two countries uh, featured as a kind of timid hostility and formally diplomatic. But we, there are a really sharp uh, and really significant shift in the Kenyan's foreign uh, diplomacy, especially in the Kibaki term, uh, which is 2002. And then that's the time actually we see that China overtook uh, Kenyan's traditional donors and uh, trades uh, overshadowed them uh, in volume and size. Okay, I was talking about this slide. Uh, we see that uh, there, there are some of the sectors that we can see the investments coming from Chinese state-owned companies and private companies. These are tra transportation, education, health, water, uh, real estate and power. And today we are going to talk about the real estate. I see them, uh, these are one of the examples of the Chinese uh, built apartments in Kenya. I see them as a kind of extension uh, where we can observe the daily impact of this, uh, this 
social and economic engagement between two countries and trying to link up this, this kind of uh, investment action with the foreign policy, which is really hard. Uh, I'm going to skip all these things. Uh, for my methodology, I'm using my primary data. It's coming from the interviews. Uh, of course, I'm also collecting secondary data. Uh, currently, uh, it's not moving, by the way. OK, OK. So these are my interview target group. You can see uh, many of them are actually Kenyan, but I allocate a chunk for the Chinese developers here. Uh, currently, I'm nearly at half of my targeted group. Uh, so today I'm going to share one of my, some of my findings from the field. Uh, I categorize my findings into four groups. The first one is actually factors bringing them these two groups. Uh, the first one is acute housing. That's the problem of Kenya. We all know that there are there is no country in the world that doesn't have any kind of housing deficit problem. But in African countries, this number is a bit high. And in Kenya, when we look at the World Bank uh, figures, over 2 million uh, deficit, we are talking about it in Kenya. And when we look at the KMBC statistic, actually they are saying 8.8 .8 million because they are taking into account the calculation of one uh, habitable room per person. The second thing, uh, there's a kind of, this is actually very well known fact by uh, everybody else. There's a kind of search for the, some of the politic, politicians. They are seeking for new channels to clean their money in this kind of, with this kind of uh, development projects. And when they see something rising uh, around the area that they are living, they just approach the developer and you know buy these uh, apartments on off market set. The second is uh, when we look at the, how they enter this local market and when did it start, we see that like many of them actually, especially state owned one, uh, it was a kind of beginning of the Kibaki term. And then they came for the infrastructure, like really big scale one and bought projects, but after that, they wanted to use this leftover machinery, finance, and etc. And when we look at the private uh, Chinese companies, actually, we see them, like many of them actually were working for these Chinese, Chinese state-owned companies, and when they see this potential on the market, they said, why we are not using this, left, uh, this machinery and start a living, a new, new kind of living in Kenya? And also, we see a kind of colonial mentality still in place. And they are shaping this, that actually shaping people's choice over moving into the western side of the, the, the Nairobi. I was always trying to understand, like, why do we have this kind of uh, the urban development projects specifically in the western side of Nairobi, and why people are, you know, coming to this area? I'm just talking about within the Nairobi. And this is actually affecting because historically, people, when they get the regular salary, they just want to get rid of this historically east land and move into the new west one, uh, west, west side of Nairobi. And when I said west, I mean Kilimani, Kilelesha, Lavington, uh, Upper Hill, or Kitisuri. And in the second group, we are going to see some facilitators. These are actually the, 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 some of the policies or some of the tools or people who are making it easier for this kind of developers to you know, get these approvals. Who are them? Uh, first, uh, we are going to see outdated policies. Uh, we talked about that, like during these conferences. Can you have too many policies, and but some of them are not really up to date, and some of them are not linked. And you are going to get an answer from this national institution that um, there is one is updated, it's going on, but still that they didn't get the approval from the executive authority. So there is always a document that they are referring to, but you are not going to get this thing. Uh, but like with these kind of things, we are still seeing these developments are going ahead of plan, and policymakers are really well aware of the situation. Actually, they meant it uh, in the in this development policy. This is actually a quotation directly coming from them, and they are saying, "Yeah, we were using this uh, two, 2006 policy uh, guidelines, and it was updated at 2016. But after that, we were still using the same policy document." But uh, when, we, when we processed this application, we were basically using discretion, practice, pre precedence, planning justification of these developers, architectures, and engineers. So anyone from this group, somehow, if they somehow convince this development, uh, this approval, uh, these executive uh, authorities, uh, their application has been uh, going to, uh, will be proceed positively. So when we see this kind of uh, really high-rise buildings, actually, we can say that they are not actually illegal. 
they are completely legal and serving for the country. The, the third uh, section is the cost of having these investments. Uh, we, we talked about the, the insufficient infrastructure going on uh, Nairobi. Uh, we talk, there is a really interesting strategy, uh, statistic I would like to share with you. Only 40% of the current residents of the Nairobi is actually getting uh, continuous water, uh, which, is, which shows that like, even like having this continuous water is really important for the residents of this uh, city. And only half of the solid waste generated by the uh, residents of this city is collected by the Nairobi Metropolitan Service and private companies. And also, so when you have this kind of insufficient uh, infrastructure, and when you add this really high rising building with, with a really quick pass and pace, uh, I think this kind of situation is going to be worsed by this kind of investment. But uh, there is nothing to do with these Chinese investment in uh, developers. This is the situation that were there before the, these developers as well. So let me share some of the pictures. This is uh, one of the examples coming from Upper Hill. Uh, you are looking at Africa's tallest high uh, high-end residential, which is 44 floor, and they got the app application approval, and the main contractor is the Chinese state company. Uh, this is a picture from Kilalesha. Uh, you can see, actually, the, some of the de uh, developments are ongoing, and you can see behind, actually, some of the high-rises in Kilimani, and in the next photo, this is actually the same, uh, this is the photo that I took it like from the same apartment, but showing a different angle. So this photo is actually Lovington, uh, which, which, is a, which has a kind of limitation in terms of having these high rise buildings. And this is from the, from the same area, but from the different angle, uh, having this kind of approvals. Finally, of course, there are some benefits uh, having these investments in, in Kenya in Nairobi, real estate market. First of all, these guys are really powerful in terms of like providing these affordable houses, which is really important for the many of Nairobiers. And uh, when I have uh, like having this interview, I saw that one of them actually telling me, we have affordable houses in Kilimani. Why do I need to go to the edge of the town to Machakos and uh, any other places? And actually they have really like stylish, stylish apartments in Kilimani and Kilalesha. The second thing is uh, these guys are really powerful and really successful in terms of like providing this constant uh, provision of water and electricity, which makes them really desirable for this uh, customer of these apartments. And the last one is the sense of uh, security and standard level of comfort. Again, these guys are providing this one and satisfying the customers. And this is my last slide. I'm always developing this one. In my research, I was looking at the Kenyans' role, Kenyan agencies' role, and which kind of members that we have this assemblage. Uh, you can see that I already mentioned many of the factors. We have development uh, approving bodies, lands itself, private planning, law, engineering, and actu uh, architectural firms. And we also have international consultancy uh, firms. So it is really intricate and complicated things that we are talking about. Uh, which is not the thing that is like set in the literature. Thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malik. You actually left one more minute. Yes. So that will be taken forward to the Q&A section. Um, I just want to call the last in-person speaker, who is Mr. Juan Hao. Um, he will, he's a PhD student at the Southeast University. He'll be talking about development characteristics of the surrounding area of typical light rail stations in Addis Ababa. So moving just north of Kenya and talking about Addis. Welcome. Thank you. you have 12 minutes. Uh, sorry, I'm just a master's student. Uh, <laughs> uh, dear professor and guest, good afternoon. My name is Huang Hao. I come from uh, Southern New State in China. Now I'm uh, studying abroad in, at uh, this uh, Beba University. I'm honored to be here. Uh, the total uh, of my report is the environment characters of the surrounding area of the typical uh, line uh, railway station in Addis Ababa. Uh, then and I will be briefed for uh, four parts. Uh, the Addis Ababa uh, line railway is the first urban line railway in, in sorry. Uh, uh, the Addis Ababa Line Railway is the first urban line railway in the 
East Africa and the longest modern urban railway in Africa. It's uh, constructed by China Railway Corp uh, Corporation and uh, adopts Chinese uh, railway technique. Uh, stance is a, a landmark project for Chinese technology to go toward the line. Railway has a total length of uh, 30. 1.6 kilometers with the two lines and uh, 33 uh, station. Uh, joining from uh, the restaurants of my free research on the Addis Ababa rail line railway, the coping grid between with the cost train around the station and the urban railway is uh, not high. The use of the space around the Addis Ababa line railway is still uh, relatively exp extensive, liking uh, referee. The, and the intense, uh, intensive planning. Uh, the design uh, single railway uh, train, uh, train state function is uh, separate from the surrounding side. It can also be kind, uh, seen from the photos that is a track. There is a clean assignment nation of the urban space and the track spots do not play their role as the uh, categories. Uh, generally speaking, it has no yet traced over development during the planning and uh, construction, railway, uh, tree state, and uh, the land use the uh, just is long, uh, is long. Uh, sorry. Uh, between the two planning is a uh, major is the uh, highlight. Okay. Uh, there are uh, uh, variety uh stories based for the development of the rivers and the railway tree station like uh, TOD, uh co Creator effect source and the urban catalog zeros. Uh, this uh, mutual zeros foundation is for development and the cost of the space uh, around the area station. There are the there are the storage uh, zeros have been widely used in place in China and uh, have been achieving very good results. But uh, in Addis Ababa, the land we are just an uh, energy project with a uh, very single function. So uh, I use uh, uh, an index to address TOD required motion uh, fiction that influence uh, the uh, traffic de uh, development around the bus stop and uh, uh, line stop. And uh, this function was divided into space or uh, not space and uh, divided according the deciding corners in different traffic areas. The fiction are relied to urban environment and transport space around the race station uh, nodes, like the uh, popular designs, the uh, common uh, designs, and the land use max uh, adjust. Um, and uh, from the from the master result of the TOD insights, we can uh, it's all to uh, see that uh, uh, like Magnia, uh, uh, uh and Street Shonglia. Uh, a real and uh, the uh, were well, as a result of the development character around the city. Uh, characters such as land use developments and the uh, distant, distant scored well. And uh, the city uh, with low TOD scores with have uh, characters similar to the suburbs uh, with, uh, with a mirror and the same uh, CMC station. So I based on the TOD in the semester station result the sites, I divide the sites into the uh, three uh, quality resources like uh, science, restoration type, and the industry type. Uh, the land use the uh, station uh, to uh, for the analyze and the uh, small type station to analyze the development characters of the surrounding areas. Like uh, the fourth is the uh, cent uh, central type. The land use station around the street leader station is complex, and the development and the construction station are purely virtual. But uh, the development difference between the north and the south uh, of the station is obvious. The public, the public function of the land around the station is not high, and the then 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 say that the surrounding road. Uh, network is not high, and uh, the uh, collection between the local traffic space are overall traffic generally. That uh, the the development and the utilization times around the street structure as a single, a uh, meaning with uh, a meaning a uh, resident lender, most uh, comprehensive housing construction and the development project. Uh, this high uh, proportion of the res uh, resident 
essential land is also uh, in constant uh, with the uh, common QD uh, circle developmental rulers. The next is uh, area is around the third station is uh, for development with uh, uh, QD, uh, uh, uh special layout and a uh, mix of uh, industry parts and uh, and the uh, inform in, uh, industry uh, residential. The connect between the uh, industry land and uh, the city is small. The both uh, environment is is mainly industrial and the transport space function and the overall bulk uh, uh, vitality is uh, is uh, uh, low. Uh, so I I choose uh, two cases uh, to introduce the Chinese uh, Chinese uh, models of space development around the railway station. Station for the TOD, uh, right for the TOD project, uh, uh, how to plan the uh, tra uh, traffic station line of the community community if I to uh, connect and the circulation lines with the transport station purpose and solve the traffic and connection problems and the different evolution is the top priority of the design. So in the uh. Hangzhou Wuchang, Hangzhou Wuchang railway station. It uh, uh, used the connected and a the update of higher difference kind uh, used to for the spatial same line with four different uh, uh, evolution to uh, apply to, to the uh, simulation of the uh, overall space. And the next case is the uh, uh, Ningbo Wanke, Ningbo Wanke Hai Shu, a first city. This is, uh, this is the uh, uh, station uh, is uh, aimed to uh, create a warm and comforting type TOD, find a comfortable circulation experience inside the business exhibition and the uh, rich experience space and use a uh, site as a link between the city uh, communication, uh, communicate and uh, the culture. So uh, by the uh, by the aligning the development and uh, the unionization uh, st state of the areas along the idea Addis Ababa uh, area, we study the quality nature development uh, strategy. Uh, of the urban rail train state and uh, the areas along the line from uh, playing a, a policy and uh, promote the areas along the line to achieve uh, uh, might uh, development uh, benefits. Uh, 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 we should uh, in introduce the Chinese uh, Chinese model and uh, promote post planning a uh, a promise a plan a suitable for the development and the construction around the Addis Ababa line rail. Uh, so we should try a uh, uh, create a realization touch media to drive relation development, strong the uh, connection of lines place and uh, form the realization major post. The master and uh, we should improve the uh, location and planning and form the characters of the uh, area. Next, uh, we should have the some uh, the like the uh, public uh, public translation continue uh, to the emperor and uh, meet uh, subject project together. Like uh, uh, the, uh, the master uh, important is the uh, symbol uh, in economy benefit. So. So I uh, try to like uh, like uh, uh, three. Uh, one, uh, please start wrapping up as well. You have one minute. Okay, great. Like uh, three straight. Like the first is the efficient and industry development along the railway station. Like in fine connect between the line railway station and the surrounding place. Uh, and uh, the use the environment construction and operation integrated construction. To the uh, uh, station con uh, construction will be seen as uh, complying with the railway test department and play and the public uh, this uh, business. And the last is uh, uh, a growing development on the, the function. Friends, 
The second is the uh, great on um, the integrated development of the railway station and the surrounding areas. And in the in this part, we should focus on the three areas. If one is a public station with the development function connect with uh, convenient living and the uh, the next is the next is uh, improve the accessibility of the railway station and Sony rail. Last is uh, promote the function ability and the compatibility of the line used in the area around the side. Now the last is the okay. Uh, is create development and the conclusion use the site as a, a castrate. Uh, so I uh, is time enough. I, I, I don't in I send uh, the too much. So uh, this is called my uh, report. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for wrapping up on time. Um, I think that was great insights on how you can look at development around the light rail and some of the principles and strategies that could be applied uh, to activate those spaces to make them ac accessible and inclusive. Um, we are moving to the last uh, speaker of the day, um, and then we'll please be jotting down your questions for each of the speakers, and we will have a round of Q&A at the end. So our last two speakers are connecting online, and it's a special session on the resilience performance assessments um, and innovative solutions to reach urban resilience and sustainability targets. Um, the talk will be done by Deirdre Soto and Karim Seluane, um, who are both, um, no, Diede is actually the head of the digital solutions and Karim is the founder and CEO of Res Resilience uh, in France. Um, is it online? Okay, great. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure for me to introduce you the Resilience Performance Assessment, FTS, an innovative solution to reach urban resilience and sustainability targets. From Didi Soto, he of Digital Elite, my, my colleague, and me, CEO and founder of Renovit. Who we are? Resilience is a design of group dedicated to resilience, uh, dedicated to territories, cities, infrastructure, projects, and their uses. We combine constructing, modeling, project coordination, and earth observation of satellite data. Resilience is based on two key pillars of expertise and skills. First of all, we have an access on the build and infrastructure data with success. And we have built a strong and deep partnership with space and climate data, notably with Space Saver Observatory from UNEP, the French National Space Agency, and the IPCC Laboratory of Climate Change, the LSCE from the CERA. Today, resilience are more than 112 projects achieved or ongoing all around the world, and uh, specifically uh, in two 19 countries. And we are main cities and big environment projects into the financial mechanism based on the air fuel all around the world. A key business segment is divided into seven thematics. Notably, international fund and climate finance, the state, cities, and local administration, the real estate companies, and land use planning. What we mean about the FTA, the digital solution to measure and follow climate change impact and loss and damage in cities. As such, the need for climate change resilience because City infrastructure are essential to tracing to the climate change more and more, and the cost of the adaptation is more expensive, around 18 and 100 billion per year to achieve a minimum resilience action. What you may observe, the shift in your climate brain potential will not only improve so for implications for internal and financial stability and the economy. For example, the cost of the climate change covered by the insurance is multiplied by four since two years. An uh, other uh, estimation of the cost of the inaction between 15 and 13% of the global GDP 
it could be a bucket if we tried the same level of the gas emission concerning the Africa. Africa is losing everywhere between 5 and 13 percent of its GDP due to climate change damage and built development based on the African Bank of Development. Next. Hello everyone, I'm Olivier uh, Soto and I will introduce you how we are based from the 10 principles of effective action for adaptation from the global ABC to uh, set the framework of the RPA. Um, the Global Alliance for Building and Construction has uh, written the 10 principles for effective action. These are 10 major principles uh, to be taken into account when we develop a climate change adaptation project. It's an institutional framework um, focused on the buildings at each uh, step of its life cycle, from the planning phase to the maintenance. And all these principles and requirements uh, take place in a digital solution, which is the RPA, and with Alliance built this methodological approach to consider both um, predictive climate models and assessment of climate change externalities in terms of cost, risks, risks and benefits. The interest of the RPA is both to combine solutions of visualization with precise and integrated dashboards, allowing risk estimation, cost quantification, and benefit cost analysis. The, the interest of the RPA is to provide to its users a, a systemic assessment of the built environment within a territory. And the RPA has been developed through different use cases and specific African use cases. The first one is an application in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, where we propose effective solution to tackle different climate change issues, such as hot uh, temperatures, uh, floodings, and uh, dryness. We also work to the application of the RPA in the in Morocco in the province of Tétouan, where the RPA has been used to provide a criticality modeling of an entire uh, specific region in the north of Morocco. Even if it's a um, huge territory, the RPA is able to provide very accurate modeling of a specific risk, such as you can see on the right, with the flooding at the scale of the city of Tétouan. And the RPA is, concern, is concerning both urban environments, but also full territories. And for this uh, use case, we work on a specific island in the Caribbean on which we provide a digital solution, the RPA, which allows to visualize the impacts of climate change for an entire uh, territory. Here's the, the Dominica. We can see different kinds of exposure maps. Here, for example, the, the land cover, but just after we will see the exposure to different kinds of um, specific climate hazards. Here, for example, floodings. We have also the possibility to analyze natural risk, such as landslides which are triggered by climate change. Cyclone, cy uh, cyclone and hurricanes can be uh, analyzed in terms of predictive exposure. And then we display maps to understand the vulnerability of built environments and societies. These maps can be overlaid with specific existing or projected major critical infrastructure, such as here the urban electric network. 
And we can use this application to go from one point to another point to identify through major cities which are the major uh, key elements to take into consideration in an adaptation planification strategy. And when you click, for example, on a specific uh, financing project, we have information on the compliance of this project with all the resilience and adaptation framework and such as the, the 10 principles that we uh, present previously. This RPA is based on a detailed and developed um, multi-criteria analysis. Um, we, we analyze all the compliance with the key institutional uh, frameworks, and we help with this solution the end users to prioritize which are the main strategic actions to be developed in their um, national determined contribution or their national to local adaptation uh, strategies. In, it integrates all the uh, criteria for enhancing uh, funding solution for the most effective and efficient projects to be developed on site. And I let my colleague Karim uh, conclude this presentation. You are mute. As you see in the previous slide, there has to be a two to combine the digital modernization, climate change, climate modernization, and financial mechanism. That's why the FDA is a legitimate tool for the financial engineering and technical adaptation to the business private partnership. The FDA is the tool to design the best balance in the project notification and the community selection in the project preparation phase to measure the design competition standard by the whole environmental competition set board. Also, the PVP procurement phase and during the implementation of the contract management phase. That's why the FTA is recognized and validated by the international finance corporation and other international financial institution to promote the best balance between the adaptation action, mitigation action, and the financial mechanism sustainable to achieve a more resilient city. Thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause to all the speakers. Um, that was really fantastic. Right on time, we are able to look at the last session also within this panel. I just want us, as we, I was told that if it's uh, five minutes, we are able to ask some questions. If it's not, we are doing comments. So I'll just take three questions from the floor. Please address to the specific speaker that you'd like uh, your question to be answered from, or it could actually be a general questions to all the speakers. I'm hoping that the speakers online uh, can also hear us. Three questions. Any questions? Good. Otherwise, we could have closed. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. My question is to Jody. Uh, you mentioned a uh, lack of social acceptability as a reason behind the failure of the project. So in your own opinion, do you think it has to do with the socio-spatial uh, socio -spatial reasons or socio-economic reasons? Is it like people don't want their environment changed or the shop owners are not willing because they are thinking it might cost them their business if it's changed? And uh, do you have any proposal on uh, how to increase the acceptability of the revitalization? Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Um... Where's the other speaker? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so I think old habits are hard to, to change, right? And people, when we're talking about 
uh, the habits that people have regarding the street, uh, those are very, very old. People are used to have one street in front of their house or their business, and they're used to do every single day the same kind of habits regarding the street, regarding the urban environment. And this is why the changes are normally so, um, it's hard to, they are hard to accept. Um, it's, it's not a case of Nairobi, it's not a case of Kenya, it's a case that it happens everywhere in the world. Um, and as solutions to, to change this, I think, well, participatory approaches, like people, if you allow the people who are complaining to participate in this process of change, from the very beginning, you sit down together with them, with the decision makers, and you make them express their feelings, express their opinions, make them understand what do they really want, or also like kind of fostering their creativity, like allowing them, showing them new cases, other cities, other experiences that happen, best cases, best practices, I think those kind of exercises are very, very helpful for um, for the citizens. And one specialty is also like to interconnect people within cities or within countries. I think we have so much to learn from from other parts of the world. If, of course, every single street and every single city and every single country has a specific uh, preconditions and backgrounds that are unique in this case. But um, the more aware are we from other cases and the more aware are we from other um examples or projects, uh, the easier it would be for us to understand that there are other possibilities and other realities that are possible within our urban environment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jody, for that. And just to also highlight um, here a particular example in Nairobi, the CBD area, doing tests such as the, I like the word street experiments, I use place making, um, really showed how walking and cycling and opening up streets can actually be beneficial to the businesses. And eventually that was actually actualized by pedestrianizing that street in Nairobi. Any other questions? Perfect. Two. So, uh... so uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I've got your name. I was really interested by your presentation on that technology principle to change or to advance, uh, let's say, non motorized transport in uh, cities. So, I would like to know if it is like user centered or people centered or human centered in general. Or also, uh, do we only use like you know tangible things uh, to actually showcase that principle? or like you know images for like road safety as you mentioned but also can a policy document be like you know instrumentally advancing this strategy also uh, sorry jody before you answer the question you just had one more question sorry uh, i have the question from miss milik and i want to ask that uh in her last powerpoint it is a difference between chinese state-owned companies to chinese private real estate companies and I want to ask what are the real difference of these two uh, two companies to the Kenya or Nairobi's uh, the whole housing system? That's all for my question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I would say that it depends on how you react on dif uh, differ on system one and system two nudges because there are two different examples on how we provide information for the population. If you use system one nudges, it is that they are probably not aware of the nudging that you provide with visual cues as bike lanes, um, colorful bike lanes. So you encourage people to use the tools. Um, and if we dis discuss African countries in Africa, um, we could provide more even cheaper infrastructure, such as painting, not using infrastructure, and using signs, just providing how people so people know how to use the cities. And then system two nudges is about triggering the mind, providing information, like, as I said in the presentation, um, look both ways before crossing. So it's about giving people information because there's a lot of people I've interviewed that they want to do something different, but they don't know how to do it. So you need to provide information about what to do using visual cues and then also having signage against highways um, and giving emotional responses so they start to think about it. And I would say that uh, policy is part of it, but it's more about showing um, visual cues on streets. Yeah. That's so maybe... <laughs> Patrick, does it answer your question? Yes, Patrick, I just wanted to follow up on that. Sorry, we are really good at that. Thank you. 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 Thank you
really running out of time. Okay, Nelly. I'm gonna keep it short. Thank you so much, Ching Li, for the question. Uh, this differentiation is really important for the literature, and there, because there's a kind of tendency, especially in the literature for political geography and the IR studies, uh, they have a kind of they just like evaluate everything else through this conception of one China, uh, which doesn't like show the reality because we know that there's a differences in terms of motivation of them, scale of them, and functionality of them. Uh, and this is also happening like in the urban uh, real estate market in the in the Nairobi way as well. Just to give an example, I would say uh, for Chinese state-owned companies, they, they are like more rooted here in terms of historically, but for, for the private ones, they are the newcomers actually, and uh, their scale of their operation is so smaller than what we have in the state companies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those shots, and I, I like the way the discussion is ongoing, but I would like to call all the panelists here before we close just to take a group picture, and I would like to thank you all for listening, and thank you for your, uh, you know, questions and interaction in this session. Please, panelists, if you can come and take a picture. So, uh, you can take, yeah, sit down and uh, where is the moderator? Yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. So, when they are taking, I mean, getting the last photo, so I would like to say uh, the last few words for the day and for the conference. Thank you very much. Another applause for this uh, wonderful presentation for the day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our fifth edition of ICASU 5. So, I know that it was a long day. We have been running, so we've been rushing, we've been squeezing things just to make sure that we all get to present and also participate in the debate. So, uh, we've been very cooperative, all of us, for doing so, and I'm so happy that everyone who was scheduled in this uh, fifth edition of ICASU was able to present and also to participate in the debate. So let's give ourselves a big round of applause for accomplishing this. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, participating in this edition of ICASU. And as you know, we have, we, this is a platform. And this is also a kind of, um, this is a think tank. So within this think tank uh, and the platform, we can keep our discussion. We can uh, collaborate. We can organize workshop. So for that, I would like to recognize and thank our partners here on the ground, first of all, the UN Habitat. Uh, for helping us to make this uh, conference possible here in Nairobi. Uh, we would like also to recognize uh, the contribution, the huge contribution of uh, the University of Nairobi, represented here by Professor Romanus, uh, also the Cooperative University of Kenya, represented here by uh, uh, Professor Emma, as well as the city county of Nairobi or Nairobi city county. I don't know how to say that. Represented here by uh, Sami. Uh, so we could not make this conference possible without the contribution of this person. So we'd like to recognize this. Let's give them also a huge round of applause for being such a trustable person. So, We'll come to the end. So we're going downstairs uh, to have a family photo as well, as we did last uh, yesterday. Uh, and we can keep our discussion. So I know that uh, we rush a little bit at the end. So if there's any question, uh, we can also, this is an opportunity to network. So let's go downstairs and thank you again for making it. We shall see ourselves in two years in China, uh, uh, as we'll be hosting us, or uh, the next edition of Mitas will be taking stage in China. Whatever city, we're definitely gonna keep in touch to let you know where, and then uh, we keep uh, uh, stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Let's go downstairs to take. Uh, okay, okay. There is uh, there is an exit. Uh, what's what's that again? A festival. So we we'll talk about the festival downstairs when we take a picture because.
need to move out because there's another activity here um, uh, organized by the hotel. Thank you very much. Let's wrap up. Okay, good. Yeah.